Hello, sociologist. We are here. Uh, it is Sunday, mon Monday morning at 12, 11 a.m. <laughs> I'm going to be <coughs> doing a lecture on paradigms. Uh, this is uh, this is weird. So we're, I, I'm still getting used to this whole thing of doing these lectures with this. So let's just do this. So we're, this, we'll see how quickly this goes because, um, um, yeah. So. This is the first part of probably three topics we're supposed to cover this week. Um, paradigms, classic theorists, and um, sociological methods. So it's a lot. There's a lot at the beginning of this class. We'll see. Normally, in a normal class, if I get a little bit behind, then I'll pick up on the next class. And so, so I'm going to try to speed through this. All right. Hey, how are you doing? Is everybody doing okay? Are they having a good week? And I don't even know what day it is. Okay, so today's discussion is about paradigms. What's a paradigm? Paradigm. Uh, paradigms are a great way to think of a paradigm is a worldview. It's kind of an umbrella of thought. And we have lots of paradigms, and sometimes we don't refer to them as paradigms. For example, if you consider yourself to be a liberal or a conservative, those are paradigms that liberals have a certain way of looking at the world and conservatives have a certain way of looking at the world. And you might not know exactly what the liberal position on COVID-19 or the conservative position on COVID-19, but if you kind of know the way those people look at the world, you could probably guess what it might be. We have paradigms that are about religion, uh, you know, a Christian paradigm or a Muslim paradigm, a certain way of looking at the world, a lens, if you will. Of looking at the world we have in our society we have medical paradigms we love to think that there's a pill to solve every problem that we have there's some medical solution or technological paradigms uh, and we've already discussed a paradigm which is the sociological paradigm the sociological <coughs> paradigm is the sociological paradigm is you're the product of your environment when and where matters we are shaped by external forces to be who we are tabula rasa that's the sociological paradigm so what we're going to do today is talk about under that broad paradigm and you know when some people say they, that person needs to shift their paradigm or we're going through a paradigm shift in society it means you know the way we sort of look at things um, we're going to talk about the three dominant sociological paradigms today tonight this morning whenever you're looking at this video um, and the three paradigms, I'm going to give you the names, and then we're going to kind of go through them, are the functionalist paradigm, the conflict paradigm, and the symbolic interactionist paradigms, which are also in the textbook. Um, and so I'm going to do these kind of chronologically, uh, and then we're going to talk about some theorists that are most associated with these paradigms. And I really wish I had a chart. Hold on a second. I'm going to go get something to write on because I feel the need to draw. Okay, got my pen and my my kids' slate. So we're going to kind of do these sort of chronologically um, as they emerge in the social consciousness of sociologists. So the first, so the idea of this is that there are um, there's a general perspective. This is how sociologists think about things, but then there are lots of debates within the sociological community. So we're going to take sort of three of those camps. So the first one is called the functionalist paradigm. Functionalist paradigm looks at society. It's a ma it's a macro level paradigm, so it looks at society on a large scale, and it looks at society in kind of an organic way. Society is an organism. So I always think about this is where I get to draw. Um, when I was in high school biology, and we would draw the cell. Boop, 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 boop. The cell. There's this is a, first. You draw the membrane, right? Here's the nucleus. And the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. That's it right there. Maybe a flagella for motility. Right? When you draw a cell in the Gerch blob and the sink, I don't know, all the stuff that's in the cell. When you draw a cell, the idea, everything in the cell is there for a reason. It all does something. Don't ask me what the Golgi apparatus does. I'm not smart enough to know. I do know that the um, cell membrane is there so the cell doesn't spill out on the floor. And the flagellus for motility, uh, but everything is there for a reason. Uh, similarly, similarly, sim uh, likewise, uh, society, everything in society is there for a reason. It's all there because 
<coughs> it performs some type of function. So we might say the cell nucleus, you know, the brain of the cell, um, in the societal cell, the family. The family is there for a reason. As we'll get into, the family is the primary socialization agent. We can't just have babies and set them on the street. We have to prepare them to be set on the street. Uh, that religion performs a function. That the media performs a function. That you know these you know core elements of our society are there for a reason. And the organism of society. Uh, is much like the cell and how it evolves. The cell evolves from a single cell creature to, you know, mitosis or meiosis. I don't remember any of this from school. And it becomes more complex, and then you get lizards, and then apes, and then, you know, the people, and then the peak of evolution, which would be Michael Jordan, 1987 Chicago Bulls. Peak of evolution, and it's been a little bit downhill ever since. Um, that, uh, you know, we get more and more complex. So we go from a, a symbol, a single, you know, virus, <laughs> it'd be pretty bad <coughs> to say that it coughs. Uh, and then it gets more and more complex. And then we have, I don't know how many cells people have, hundreds, I have no idea. Uh, you know, we're very complex organisms. Well, likewise, uh, society goes from, you know, small tribal hunting and gathering groups to more and more complex, you know, nations of 300 million people, where it becomes very, very complex. And so there's a slow evolutionary process of the social organism. And the stuff that is no longer needed goes away, like the tail. You know, we have tail bones as a vestige from when we had tails a million years ago. So uh, society loses the things it doesn't need anymore. We don't need the Pony Express anymore. Uh, the travel agents, when was the last time you went to a travel agent, right? They have evolved out of the system, but new things have come into the system. And I think the moment that we're in right now with, um, this pandemic is new things are coming into the system. We're learning more and more about how to do things online and to work from home and we're changing and slowly evolving as a society. So what functionalists are always interested in is how something functions. How something functions. What is the function of something? If something is there, it must be functional. What is the function of religion? Well, we're going to talk about that one, believe me. What is the function of television? You know, it's there because it provides a function. But also, since it is an organic picture of the world, sometimes things cannot work. You can have what's called dysfunction. So, for example, in the cell, if the Golgi apparatus starts breaking down, it's going to cause a ripple effect through the whole cell. There's going to be some type of breakdown of the organism because one thing impacts another. So, for example, functionalists would say, you know, if there's a problem in society, maybe you could trace it back to the family. Maybe the family is not working and therefore it's producing kids who don't respect authority and becoming criminals and, you know, there's a ripple effect through all of society. There's a breakdown. Something is dysfunctional. So we can look at social problems as a dysfunction of an organism. Sometimes, as we'll talk about in our next video, if the change happens too fast, because this is slow, this is Darwin, this is slow evolutionary views of things <coughs> changing very slowly. If they change too fast, then all of a sudden everything is sort of out of source, and maybe it'll be dysfunctional that way because you weren't allowed to do that kind of slow adaptation. I think about the sort of evolutionary climb out of the ooze that led us to this wonderful state of humanness that we're in. Um, but also, it's possible uh, for something to be dysfunctional, but also be functional. So, for example, we always talk about crime. Crime is dysfunctional. You know, it's a breakdown of the organism. Functions would say something's not working right. The schools aren't working right, or the family's not working right. Something's not working, and so there's a, a dysfunction. Um, but it's but it has been made. The case has been made that crime actually helps society. This guy Durkheim, who we're going to talk about in the next video, uh, asked the question uh, over a hundred years ago: What if nobody ever broke the law? What if nobody ever broke the law? What would happen? Well, first of all, a lot of people would lose their jobs, right? All the judges and cops and 
probation officer. There's all these people who would be thrown out of work if nobody broke the law. A lot of people would shut down TV production because there would be no good crime to cover on the news or on NYPD Blue or whatever your favorite cop show is. That's from the 80s. This is as current as I go. Um, what's the show? Law and Order? <coughs> uh, like all those people would lose jobs. But also, you wouldn't evolve as a society. And he used the example of um, Socrates. But we could use the example of Rosa Parks. So I, I know you know who Rosa Parks is. Rosa Parks uh, broke the law. Rosa Parks was a criminal. Rosa Parks violated the laws of segregation in Alabama. Uh, and, and by sitting in a part of the bus, it was re reserved only for white people. And she was a black lady. She broke the law. She got arrested uh, and caused a conversation about the legitimacy of the laws, the Jim Crow laws of segregation, and led to the evolution of those laws, because we had a conversation about that. Martin Luther King Jr. was a criminal. Martin Luther King did some of his best writing in jail, right? There are mugshots of Martin Luther King Jr. He broke those laws, and it caused us to have a conversation about the legitimacy of those laws, and led to the Civil Rights Act. Uh, that by violating those laws, it allows us to kind of evaluate do those laws matter or not. I'll give you an example that's not quite as famous um, as Rosa Parks and, and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, a guy named Michael Hardwick in the 1980s in Atlanta. Michael Hardwick was a gay man who lived in an apartment, uh, in a house in Atlanta, in a part of town called Ansley Park, beautiful part of Atlanta. Uh, and it was also kind of a, a little bit of a place. If you were gay in the South, the one place you could feel safe in is Atlanta, and the one place in Atlanta that you could feel safe in was in Ansley Park. So it was kind of a gay, gay neighborhood in Atlanta. Uh, Michael Hardwick didn't pay his parking tickets. Not a good thing. You got to pay your parking tickets. If you don't pay your parking tickets, sooner or later they're going to come looking for you. Cops come and uh, knock on the door and say, "Is Michael Hardwick here?" Has been paying his parking tickets. His roommate, this is officially the worst roommate in the, in the world, says, yeah, he's back in his bedroom. Why don't you go talk to him? Cops don't have a warrant. You don't have to let him in. I'm just telling you that as a, you know, a little bit of a legal advice. But the cop goes into Michael Hardwick's house, goes to the house, opens the bedroom door, and finds Michael and his boyfriend engaged in sexual activity. Uh, Georgia, at the time, had these anti gay laws that were on the books since before the founding of the state. They were called blue laws that outlawed sodomy. And sodomy, by the way, includes not just oral anal sex, but also oral sex. So you might be sodomizing someone and not even know it. Uh, and so this cop knew these ancient laws and arrest Hardwick. Doesn't arrest his boyfriend, so you can figure out who was doing what to whom. But arrest him. And of course, Michael Hardwick was like, uh, excuse me, consenting adults in the privacy of our bedroom. Get the hell out of here. And the cop was like, nope, this is a violation of the law. We're, we're, I'm arresting you under Georgia's anti-sodomy laws and you're going to jail. And they took him to jail. And of course, you know, it made the news because people were like, you know, this is the uh, 1980s. People were like, well, uh, come on now. What? The people are allowed to do consenting adults in the privacy? Come on. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1986, Hardwick versus the state of Georgia. Uh, and the Supreme Court upheld Georgia's sodomy laws and sent Michael Hardwick to prison. You think that's sort of what might happen to somebody like that in prison. Uh, uh, the irony is not lost. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. The, uh, in a county south of Atlanta, kind of a rural county, I won't name the name of this county, <clears throat> I don't want to stigmatize it any farther. I'll just say I have spent the night in this jail. Uh, the sheriff uh, was uh, the sheriff of the county was on his lunch break. His wife brought him lunch. And this story, by the way, this Michael Hardwick story made the news. It was big news all over the country that this, you know, this man engaged in this consulting uh, sexual relationship was arrested. Um, so everybody was talking about sodomy. So the wife uh, of the sheriff brought the sheriff lunch. And brought him something a little extra, extra, if you know what I'm talking about. And a deputy walked in and found uh, them engaged in uh, what is defined by the state as sodomy and arrested the sheriff. Arrested the sheriff. So, again, you can figure out who was doing what to whom. And good on the sheriff. Uh, and the sheriff held a news conference. And the sheriff said, 
you know, because there were people who were like, you are being charged by the same law, but the same law that Michael Hardick was. He went to prison. Are you going to go to prison? And he said very clearly, and I'm going to quote this guy because I remember watching this on the, on the news. Uh, that law is just for queers. Well, there you go. The law wasn't meant for straight people who engage in sodomy. And a lot of straight people engage in sodomy. I think you know what I'm talking about. It was meant to police, you know, a minority population. But because of these cases, uh, there was a national conversation. First, no politician wanted to be like the pro-sodomy candidate. Uh, but, you know, it started a conversation. And then about 10 years later in Texas, it went up. About, it was Texas, of all places, went up in front of the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court finally said these sodomy laws are unconstitutional. Americans in all 50 states now have the right to sodomize each other in a con con consensual, loving way. So go for it. Um, but anyway, the point of that is, is that there is this sort of slow evolution, and even crime can be seen as being functional. So functionals are always interested in function and dysfunction, also interested in, in consensus, the sort of notion of how we have these conversations to allow the organism to evolve. Okay, that's the functionalist part. I'm going to come back to go through all three of these. Um, the conflict paradigm. The conflict paradigm is also a macro level paradigm, and it's interested in power. Power is the main issue here. Groups having power, not individuals, but groups having power. And if we were to diagram gosh, my kid's marker is almost dead. If we were to diagram, can you see that? Uh, it's a group, one group has power, really. Hold on one second, I'm going to go get a better marker. Be right back. Okay, so if we were to diagram the conflict paradigm, I'm using the chalk side now, it would be, a, it looks sort of like that. One group has power, And one group doesn't. So let me give you some examples of groups that have power. It's <laughs> excellent. Groups that have power. Uh, um, we could talk, as we'll talk about in this class at, at length, because we're reading The Chalice and the Blade, the notion of patriarchy. And that we have a society where men have power over women. We're going to talk. And if you don't believe it, you will believe it by the end of this class. I don't think all women understand this. But a lot of men are like, well, what about Oprah? Um that there is a society built in that gives men advantage. We could talk about the power of race, despite, you know, the fact that we've had a black president. We still have a society that favors white people. Sorry, it's true. And if you don't believe it, you will. Uh, we have a society that favors straight people. There's a, you know, there's a power dynamic based on straight and not straight. The most obvious one, I think, that people would understand is the rich and the non-rich. The rich have a lot of access to power, have a lot of goodies, and the rest of us are trying to pay off our credit cards, right? There is a real power dynamic. That's the term that we use, the haves and the have-nots. So the conflict perspective is always going to be looking at the power dynamics in society. We're going to focus a lot on gender, but we're also going to talk about things like class and race in here, in this class. Um, and so power, uh, here, when there's one of the terms that we sort of think about is this term, all right, I'm gonna, status quo. Status quo, <coughs> my bad handwriting. Uh, status quo is Latin for status is the same. Uh, the wealthy want to maintain the status quo. It's good to be the king. Men want to maintain patriarchy. It's good to be the king. White people want to main a white supremacist society because it's nice to be on top and have everybody want to look like you. They want to keep things as they are, which means the people on the losing side of this, the folks down here, are getting screwed, right? They are being exploited on some level and are denied access to power. So when change comes, instead of the slow evolutionary Darwinistic notion that you get from um, the functionalist perspective, change here is revolutionary because it's these people saying screw these people we want to get we want some change we want some of what they have so if you think about the labor union movement if that came from the bottom it didn't come from the bosses that said hey why don't we have a 40-hour work week and pay these people more uh, uh these people on the bottom if you think about the civil rights movement it came from people of color it wasn't white people who said hey you know let's invite everybody to the table it was people of color it was the martin luther kings of the world that say hey we're going to challenge the status quo 
you think about the feminist movement, it wasn't men say, hey, let's, you know, stop sexually harassing women and pay them the, the same that we get paid. Nope. It was women got their act together and started challenging the status quo. So change here is revolutionary. And I don't mean revolutionary in terms of um, violence. Uh, it could be just sort of getting together and challenging the power dynamic to create real change in society, create some type of equality. And um, so here social problems are up to the product of the power dynamic, of people being screwed, of people being exploited. Uh, the social problems that we get here are because people are not having their needs met down on the bottom. And these people here are kind of you know, taking advantage of them. So the power dynamic. And so, um, yeah, discussion question coming up in a minute. Uh, the third paradigm that we have is a little bit different. The third paradigm is called the symbolic interactionist perspective. The symbolic interactionist perspective. The symbolic interactionist perspective is different because it's more micro. It's more about kind of the individual. There's our non-gendered individual. Uh, and the influences around them. And that in, those influences include the influences of the family and their friends and their school and their church and the, their favorite TV show. There are all these things that are sort of writing on you. And so the, the key here is through this process, through this process of being written on blank slate, Tabula rasa, um, you develop what, what symbolic interactionists would call a shared understanding. How do we know what things mean? How do you know when you, if you were to see a, you know, be driving down the street and you see a sign at the end of the street and somebody spray painted, completely covered it, but it was an octagon, how would you know what that sign meant? Right? You developed a shared understanding. That's a stop sign. Even though I can't see the word stop. It's a stop sign. Here's even better. Speaking of driving, here's an even better example. You're driving on the highway. Speed limit is 55. But what's the real speed limit? Right? It says 55. Right? You know, you know that if it's 55, everybody's driving 65. How do you know that? It's not written on the sign 55, but 65 is cool. Don't go over that. Get a ticket. Right? You develop through your interaction with riding with your parents or riding with your friends or riding in the car and seeing other people. Oh, oh, everybody's going a little bit faster than the speed limit. If you're driving the speed limit, people are going to honk at you. They're just going too slow. You develop this sort of shared understanding. Um, and so we've already talked about this. This is about, again, how humor works. This is the social construction of reality. It's a symbolic interactionist perspective. We develop a shared understanding. And so therefore, when we get social problems from this perspective, it's because there's a breakdown in that shared understanding. Sometimes when you have a very diverse society, people might have a different understanding of what the Sabbath means, right? Different religions have the Sabbath on different days. It could cause some problems. How to discipline a child, the importance of honoring your family. What about a, a, a difference in the shared understanding of how we treat our elders? Right in America, the shared understanding is as soon as your parents are old enough, you ship them off to the retirement home and you sort of forget that they're there until they pass away. And you're like, oh, yeah, I missed them. Uh, a lot of other families, including Mexican families, bring the elders in. You want abuela in the house. My mom, who's in her 70s, uh, is sort of surprised that we want her to move in with us. She's like, why do you want, you know, a, with this old, an old woman to come live with you? <clears throat> and I'm like, Mom, I am an adopted son of Mexico. In Mexico, this is what you do. You bring, you know, Grandma into the house because you got child care. You got pan dulces. You got cakes and pies and also child care. That's the main thing. And plus, you know, you're close in. You know, we get to share those, those experiences with you. It's not just purely selfish. You know, we want to have our family close. So there's, you know, sometimes there's a conflict in the shared understanding. So here's a great symbolic interaction of saying, hey, are we all on the same page here? Are we on the same page? Right. That if you've ever heard somebody say that, that's a symbolic interaction of saying it means do we have a kind of a shared understanding? OK. So I'm going to do what I'm going to do to kind of weave all these together and then I'm going to go to sleep uh, is give you an example of something from our culture that can be dropped into all three paradigms. And then what I want you to think about, and this is going to be uh, a, either a discussion question, um, which paradigm do you think best represents the chalice and the blade? Functionalist, conflict, symbolic interactions. Okay. Um, there is a bumper sticker when in, the, in, the day, in the BC days, BC, before Corona, 
um, that I used to see driving around Portland. It said MLB and PDX. MLB and PDX. Now, do you know what that means? I'm from Atlanta. I definitely know what that means. MLB is Major League Baseball. PDX is Portland. Uh, and it's about a campaign to bring a Major League Baseball team to Portland. We have basketball, the Blazers. We have soccer. Right? No, this isn't, this isn't the Timbers. This is the uh, Monarchs of, of Morelia from Mexico. I just really miss soccer at this point. God. Oh, I can't guess how uh, Anyway, uh, there's, a, there's a movement to bring um, Major League Baseball to Portland. They've even got an area decide, just figured out where they're going to build the stadium. It's either going to be kind of in the Northwest Industrial Area or they're going to tear down the Lloyd Center and build a baseball park right there, which is great because I can walk to the stadium. Uh, and as a Major League Baseball fan, I, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Okay, so let's drop this into the three paradigms. And, how, and kind of take a look at what some of the things uh, each would look like. So functionalists, what would functionalists be interested? The first thing functionalists would be interested in is, would this be functional for the city of Portland? What would be the functions of this? And so you can think of you know, the whole list of functions. It would create jobs, right? The jobs to build the stadium, the jobs on the team, the jobs for the people who work at the stadium, the jobs of all the sportscasters, and the people that park the cars, and the people that you know write about it. I mean, there's just going to be incredible amounts of jobs created by this. It's very functional. Functional for the economy. Functional for our identity. You know, I'm from Atlanta, home of the Braves, right? You, you say you're from Atlanta, and people just immediately start talking about the Braves. It could be functional to create, help create an identity for the city. I mean, the Blazers do it a little bit, but... You know, it's also functional and it gives people a source of entertainment. Like baseball, I don't know how you feel about it, but baseball can be hugely entertaining. And so, you know, it can be functional in that way to give us, you know, America's pastime, as they call it. So it can be very entertaining. Uh, and sometimes there's functions, what we call latent functions, that you don't even recognize. So, for example, in America, in general, when the World Series is on in October, the crime rate in America drops. What? Huh? How does that work? Because people that normally would be stabbing each other are like watching the game because it's, you know, it's really important to a lot of people. So there's all kinds of like functions associated. There are also some dysfunctions, right? Traffic is going to be a problem. I don't know if you've ever tried to drive around the Moda Center when there's a Blazers game, but it's just a hassle. More pollution, more trash, maybe more violence, uh, you know, because people get angry at baseball games. Um, kids might not study if there's a game on, right? They may be like, you know, dropping out of school because they're too paying too much attention to baseball. So what functionalists will do is they'll take, <coughs> excuse me, take the, the functions and the dysfunctions and they'll weigh them against each other. And this is what's happening in Portland right now. There's a conversation. Is baseball going to bring more positive functions to Portland than more negative dysfunctions? And if it's functional, you know, maybe the case will be made that we'll have it, but it's dysfunctional, you know, maybe not. So this is what happens in the organism. If something like, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, let's stick with the, with the travel agent. You know, it's, it's no longer as functional as it used to be and more dysfunctional because you have to park to go to the travel agent as opposed to going on to Expedia. It goes away. It goes out of our organisms. So, uh, so from a functionalist perspective, is Major League Baseball functional? Or is it dysfunctional for Portland? Those are the types of questions it would be asked. The conflict perspective is going to be looking at the power dynamic. What are the power dynamics at work? First of all, you have the economic power dynamic between the owners and the players, right? I mean, it was about uh, 20 years ago now that the Major League Baseball players went on strike because they feel like they didn't have enough power over these incredibly wealthy owners that were controlling them, off, uh, you know, often making them feel like they were slaves on a plantation. Uh, there's also the uh, the economic dynamic of the people who work in the stadium. I think people are going to get rich selling hot dogs. I don't know. I think hot dogs would probably be sushi or something. That's what they sell at, at the Mariner Stadium in in, uh, <laughs> in Seattle. In Atlanta, it's like it's like beer, cheap beer, and hot dogs. You go to a Mariners game and it's and it's micro brew and sushi. So it'll probably be some version of. But people don't. You know, people are are, are generally poor in that. Also, there's a power dynamic with regards to race. You know, it's the white owners 
and the players of color, and even on the team. You know, traditionally the pitcher and the catcher and the first baseman are the white guys, and the people you know who are minorities are playing out in the outfield. That started to change a little bit, but there is a racial dynamic. The coaches and the managers tend to be white guys, so there's a racial dynamic. There's also a power dynamic around gender. Where's the female equivalent? Where are the female baseball players, right? You don't you don't get any women on the field. Occasionally you get a female reporter, but pretty much it's a man's world. All this energy to go celebrate male sports and there's no female equivalent to it. So there is a there are several power dynamics that the conflict people are going to look at. Uh, and, you know, who has power over whom, which group, not individual, but which group has power over which group. <coughs> uh, finally, the symbolic interaction is they're going to take it down to a micro level. What is the shared understanding? What does it mean to have baseball? Now, this is kind of an interesting thing because I bet a lot of you could care less, are not interested about baseball the least. I mean, come on, this is America's sport. Baseball, apple pie, mom, those three things, that's the holy trinity in America. Those things go together. So, of course, you don't want a baseball team? Well, the shared understanding of baseball has changed, right? America is changing. America is becoming more diverse. Baseball is declining in popularity. Oh, break my heart. And you know what's increasing in popularity? Soccer, right? The world's sport. Soccer is becoming much more popular now in many places. Even in Atlanta, the baseball games in Atlanta are not outselling the soccer games in Atlanta. Soccer is king in Atlanta. So there's a, a change in the shared understanding about how important baseball is to a lot of us old timers. Baseball is hugely important. I can't believe I live in a city without a major baseball league. And it's so horrible to have to drive all the way up to Seattle to see their crappy team, the Mariners, the, one of the crappiest Teams ever in the history of baseball. Sorry, except for each hero. Um, the uh, so, but you know, there's been a change. There's been a demographic shift. So the ba baseball doesn't mean what it used to mean, and so there's there's this new shared understanding that like, eh, maybe baseball, maybe not. So on a micro level, uh, it's not as exciting as it may may would may might have been 30 years ago, for example. In back in the 90s, those were the days. Of the Lord years. Oh, that was a good one. Um, anyway, the uh, and so the, the symbolic interactionists are going to look at the micro level uh, issues around that. How do we know what we know, right? You guys probably don't pay that much attention to baseball. It's not in the local news, right? They don't cover it very much. When the World Series is on in Portland, I have to go around and like, please, you know, go to a sports bar, like they're playing football games or whatever, and like, please. Turn off this basketball game. It's the World Series. Put on the World Series. And they're like, huh? But yeah, we got a soccer game coming on in a few minutes. It just doesn't. It just doesn't have the same connection to people on that micro level, at least here in Portland. So that would be sort of the three paradigms. Functionalists would look at it, the functionality of it. Conflict people would look at the power dynamic. Symbolic inter interactionists would look at how we sort of develop on a micro level our understanding of it. Okay, we're going to come back to these three paradigms over and over and over again. But the question for you, good student, is, um, Isler, tell us in the blade, which paradigm do you think that there should be an obvious answer to that, but you might be able to make the case for all three. Which, 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 which paradigm best uh, fits uh, what Isler is doing in the challenge in the blade? That, that will be our discussion question. We're going to, we'll zoom in on that one. Okay. All right, I'm done for the night. This is it. Peace out. Uh, more videos and crap coming. Good night. Good morning. Good day. Uh, uh, Vida Zane. Au revoir. Au revoir.